Hey, listen, before you're seated, can you just thank our young adults worship team? Come on, didn't they do an amazing job? I tell you this, and you can go ahead and fist bump somebody, grab a seat. As you're doing that, let me just go ahead and brag on, on this young adult ministry. They meet on Thursday nights in our uh, Go Youth Auditorium and in the gym, and they do a lot of outreach and groups. If you consider yourself, it's subjective. Young adults is a subjective ministry, okay? So if you think you're a young adult, just show up, okay? And they'll, uh, they'll love you to life, and they are uh, anointed to lead people in worship. And they're not the church of tomorrow. They're the church of today. And so I'm just really, really proud of them and, and honored to get to share the stage. Everything that, that we just read together from Revelation chapter five, and if you brought your Bible or uh, if you have it on your phone, I, I'm just one of the, I'm a little old school. I think you should probably have that out and you, you just need to mark a bunch of things up tonight. Everything that we just read in Revelation chapter five is the promise of things to come, but this setting is going on right now. Like right now, this is happening. Uh, on, a, on a first Wednesday in spring break, I feel like I've got permission to maybe go a little deep because you're here on first Wednesday during spring break, okay? So like, you just love Jesus. That is the only reason you're in this room. So can we just, I wanna, I wanna get in the deep end a little bit today. Right now, like right now, while we're singing to God, all of creation is singing these songs too. There is a world that is more real than the one we're in right now, which I know is hard to, it, it doesn't work when you think about it, but what we're experiencing here is gonna feel like a dream. It's gonna feel almost as if it didn't even happen at all when we get in the place of the real place where we were made to dwell forever. You also need to know this, based on that passage, you and I are not the only creatures worshiping him right now. There are, there is nature, and, and, and this nature created by God is, is worshiping him and is honoring him. There are angels and, and elders in heaven that have gone on to be with the Lord that are singing out his praises right now. And this is something that we have got to embrace, and that's really the whole point of what I wanna talk to you about today if I can do anything, I just, I just wanna hopefully maybe awaken your heart to wanna worship Jesus. This is probably gonna be one of the least flashy, least impressive, almost no practical steps to what I'm gonna say today uh, because I, I, this is so much bigger than just decisions you make. And look, the decisions you make are obviously important, but this is even bigger than that. This is this is the Lamb of God, this is the Lion of Judah, this is the Root of David, this is, this is the only thing that really matters. And if we don't worship, you're gonna buy into a gravitational pull that our culture has us in, where we, we just worship ourselves, where individualism is, is running rampant. Now, uh, we all have these unique and individual qualities that are given to us by God. We're all made in the image of God, and so I'm not saying that your individuality doesn't matter. Your individuality matters. That's what separates us from Eastern religion. Eastern religions would say that, you know, our life here, we're like a bunch of dew drops, and after we die, we just go into the all soul, right? Your individuality is a myth. You don't have an identity. Just, just lose it. No, you have a unique purpose, a unique calling, a unique identity, and it was given to you so that you could worship God in that unique way. You bear a specific image of God that no one else perfectly bears the way that he made you is differently the way that he made them, and we are all supposed to reflect his image. So you have individuality, but if you withhold worship from the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, you are like a thread being pulled away from a tapestry that has been assembled to glorify God. That's, that's the problem with individualistic culture is we think that everything we do and that this life is all about us. We want to be the objects of worship. And we wouldn't say that. You, you wouldn't say that out loud because you know that doesn't sound good. But the way that we choose to live, and I'm speaking with broad strokes here, but the way we choose to live would suggest otherwise 
that we have a hard time wanting to buy into something when it doesn't directly benefit us. We have a hard time caring about things that don't directly impact us. But listen, you will lose your unique purpose and your unique identity when you start to pull your thread away from that tapestry. You will start to lose it. You'll start to experience, and look, this is why communities and families and even churches experience breakdown. Because we become overzealous for individualism and it leads to personal breakdown because we know we wanna be worshiped but we can't find enough people to worship us. We know we have all these desires and we wanna fulfill it because we think that's the ultimate virtue in life is to never have any desire go unfulfilled. But the way we were wired was to be wired together in a community. And what Revelation 5 is showing us is that all of eternity, we are a part that we are invited into to play into it, but it is not about us. It is all about the one sitting on the throne and the Lamb of God who was slain. It is all about Jesus and it is not about us. And I know that that's not like a new thing you've heard preached before, but I hope that when you hear it, you can let it sink in a little bit deeper. The way that I've been doing this, this all week long, I, I would say it like this, putting it on the screen. Well, I thought I'd put it on the screen there. Help me out, Josh Stevens. Nope, he's not back there either. He was playing the drums today. Just, they'll put it up there in a second for me. You were not designed to be an object of worship. You were designed to be an instrument of worship. You were not designed to be an object of, of worship. You're designed to be an instrument of worship. And so today, I just wanna get us there. I just wanna get us to that place where we long for that. Uh, preparing this sermon has been uh, a great encouragement to, be, to me. It's been a great challenge to me. And uh, it's something that I've, I've really just, I'm in this place right now, and, and I don't know, some of you might not be able to relate to this, maybe some of you do. I'm just kind of in this place where I just want, I just want something so deep and so real in my walk with God right now. And some of the things that, you know, maybe used to fulfill and satisfy, just don't quite do that anymore. And I wanna know, I mean, I wanna know that I'm walking with him. I wanna know that I'm walking in the fullness of all that he has for me. And so today, let's meditate on the worthiness of Jesus. So we're reading from Revelation. And, in, and when you read Revelation, there's a, there's a temptation that we have, and I'm gonna beg you, I'm gonna beg you to please correct this when you read and approach the book of Revelation. Do not focus so much on the how and the when, when you read the book of Revelation. If you're new to church, the book of Revelation is, is the book that is the, the story of things yet to come, okay? So do not obsess, I'm assuming I'm talking mostly to Christians right now, please, please stop obsessing over the how and the when, okay? Those things matter, but guess what? You, you were never put in charge of figuring that out to begin with. No one knows the day, no one knows the hour, so, so just calm down, okay? Like, you don't have to figure it out. You can't figure it out. Don't spin your wheels on that. And here's why. It's not because it's like a pet peeve or anything like that. It's because you're missing out on the beauty of what's happening in the book of Revelation because you're so focused on, on blood moons and eclipses and, and all the things going on. Focus on, on what's happening here. We're in the throne room of heaven and you're worried about, about things and oh, is this lining up here? And the, Listen, it's not about burying your head in the, sand. I, in the sand. I just don't want us to miss out on the beauty of scripture. So the better question is not how and when, it's who and why. And this passage tells us exactly who is worthy and why they're worthy. So uh, let's start reading here and I'll, I'll break it down. I'm in the ESV today. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. So this is a guy named John. He's writing this. He's getting this revelation. And in chapter five, he sees the right hand of him seated on the throne. He sees God on the throne holding this scroll. So this scroll represents God's will and his plan for salvation and judgment for the entire creation. God's perfect plan of everything that's going to happen, and he sees him holding it right now. And the scroll is sealed with seven seals. 
Anytime you see the number seven, and again, you're Christians, you know this, but I'm not insulting your intelligence, but it just means the number of perfection, the number of completion. So anytime you see that, that's a, it's a highly repeated thing throughout scripture here, and there's seven seals on it. And this is actually more than just a Jewish tradition, this is actually a Roman tradition. That legal Roman documents, like, like wills of, of those who were very wealthy that wanted to, to leave a written will, they had to have it sealed seven times with seven wax seals in the presence of three eyewitnesses. And the, the only people allowed to, to open the seals were those who, who had that family crest attached and it was this whole thing. We've even seen in archeological findings just to support this, uh, the wills of Augustus and Vesp Vespasian were discovered both to have seven seals on them. So this is a, a common tradition here. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, the same song we were singing a second ago, who is worthy, who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth, basically in all of creation, no one was able to open the scroll or to even look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Now look, I know that for some of you, when you, when you read a lot of Bible, when you hear a lot of these things, you can, you can try to tune out here, but I want you to try to put yourself in John's position here for just a second. The reason that he's weeping loudly. He's, he's, he's feeling emotion because he was so desperate to know what was going to happen. In chapter four, they told him that he was gonna know everything, that it was gonna be revealed to him. And now we're in a crisis. Someone lost the keys. Who's supposed to open this thing? How are we gonna ever know? What's gonna ever happen? Will there ever be punishment for the wicked in this world? Or is, and if there is punishment for the wicked, how am I to be sure that I'm not one of the wicked because I've done wicked things? And all these questions racing through his mind, maybe you can relate to that too. Is anyone ever gonna repay for the evil and the awful things being done in this world? And if so, what hope is there for me? And where are they gonna draw the line? And, and what is the hope for all of creation? All these questions rushing through John's mind. Imagine how he was feeling in this moment here, and now imagine the relief he feels whenever this is said to him. One of the elders, this is a representative of the church. This is those who have gone on to be with the Lord, and there's 24 elders, you can see this in, in chapter four, 24 elders around the throne representing the body of Christ uh, set back 2,000 years ago. One of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah the root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. So who is worthy? Who is worthy? It's the lion of Judah. The lion of Judah is worthy to open the scrolls. Now for us, we're not, we're not Jewish. We didn't grow up with these traditions. And unless you really grew up just studying the Old Testament, this is a sound that, yeah, I've heard that sung in a couple of songs before. And yeah, what, what even is that Lion of Judah? Where, where does that come from? For John, the moment he heard this phrase, he knew exactly what it was. And it's an Old Testament prophecy all the way back in Genesis chapter 49. This is the prophecy. Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hands shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down before you. This is one of the tribes of Israel. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion and as a lioness. Who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until the tribute comes or until the one comes to get it back. And to him shall be the obedience of all the peoples. So John understood this. This is a prophecy about the lion of Judah. And what is the lion of Judah going to do? He's gonna do what we hope that someone will do soon. Think about it, creation right now, you don't have to be a, a theologian to understand this, creation right now is spiraling out of our control. Anyone who thinks they've got control, you're, just, you're, you're under a delusion. We have no control and we're becoming ever increasingly aware of the fact 
that things are spiraling beyond our ability to stop it. Humanity is becoming more depraved by the day. The confusion setting in, the evil that's continuing to spread and, and not only that, but even in Romans chapter eight, we learned that nature itself is groaning. Every hurricane, every earthquake, every tornado is nature crying out to be redeemed because our sin in the garden broke everything about creation. It broke it and it's desperate for a lion of Judah to come back and to demand and command the obedience of the peoples. We need a mighty leader to restore order. So why is the Lion of Judah worthy? Because he's the only one fierce enough to command the obedience of creation. And if that's offensive to you, I'm not trying to be like commanding obedience. What's that all about? You've obviously never been in like a kindergarten class before, okay? Because when, when kindergartners go a long time, I dare you, just lead a class, serve in, go, well, not in Go Kids, go to another church down the road, okay, and, and start serving in their, in their kids' ministry, and, and if you're the only one in there, just step out for a few minutes and leave a camera recording the chaos that will take merely seconds to happen, okay? Someone's gotta get back in there and command the order of that classroom, and this is what's happening with the Lion of Judah. A lion is fierce. You don't mess around with a lion, at least not if you wanna live, so you don't do that. Lions command obedience, they command respect. We need this, we need that from God. But not only is the Lion of Judah mentioned, there's another prophetic figure that's mentioned here in verse five. He says, behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seals. So, so who is worthy? The root of David. Now again, a lot of context here, a lot of history, but I promise you it's, it's about to get good here in just a second. This is another prophetic title given to the Messiah that again, John would have immediately recognized this, but for us, we gotta go back to Old Testament to see this, because this is prophecy being fulfilled. Now I'm about to show you another verse here, and I just want you to know this. When you get in conversations with people who are skeptics and, and non-believers, and they say, why would you even believe in this? You have got to say, you have got to at least mention at one point, because of all the fulfilled prophecies that happen, that there's just no way. I challenge you, go back and read the book of Isaiah, which was written hundreds of years before Christ ever walked the earth, and you will start to see how he is the fulfillment of every prophecy. You couldn't have made this stuff up. It's just not even possible. And in Isaiah chapter 11, we see this prophecy. There shall come forth from a shoot from the stump of Jesse. Pause right there. Because every skeptic will say, aha, no, no, no. You said the, the root of David, and this says the stump of Jesse. Okay, fair, a root and a stump, they're the same thing, right? Like, that's, that's the same thing. Jesse is actually the father of David, okay? So this is, the, this is still the fulfillment of this prophecy. And a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord, he shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The root of David. Look at how he's uniting a divided world right here. And look, even if, even if it was just America, we need this type of leader because look, everyone on both sides could buy in to this prophecy being fulfilled. Because on one hand, if you lean a little bit to the left, you love this part, with righteousness, he shall judge the poor and equity for the meek. And anyone left leaning is gonna be like, I love that, give me some more of that. And then anyone right leaning is gonna be like, okay, yeah, but let's get to the next part. I, li I like this one here. Yeah, the rock, strike the earth, right? With the breath of his lips, he shall kill the wicked, right? The morality, he's gonna bring back morality. And anyone depraved will not be able to be in his presence. We need a leader to drive out wickedness, but we are also desperate for a leader to help those that need his help. And he's gonna be the perfect judge of how to judge the poor, right? 
Were they actually poor by their own decisions or were they poor by a lot of nuances here? The point is this, the root of David, he's the perfect king. Why is the root of David worthy? Because he's the only perfectly righteous king. When any of us try to make these types of decisions, when we're trying to help the poor and the oppressed, or when we're trying to, to bring judgment down on the wicked, we don't do it perfectly righteous. We don't get it right. We miss it, we mess up. That's why we are continuing to spiral out of control. We need not just a God-fearing president, we need God himself, the root of David, to reign over all of creation. That is our hope, it's no party can get it. This is our hope right here. This is the king we need. Now before we read the next verse, again, put yourself back in John's perspective for just a minute. You were weeping, you were looking down, you were afraid for your life, for your family, for all of creation. Your hope awakened as one of the elders says, hey, hey, come on, pick your head up, the Lion of Judah, the Root of David. And you start to feel like, okay, I'm about to meet my hero. I'm about to meet the one my parents told me about him when I was a little kid around campfires. They would tell us there's a Messiah coming. The root of David is coming. The Lion of Judah is coming. He's gonna defend the oppressed. He's going to kill the wicked. He's gonna bring his kingdom down. This is going to be a hero. And then he looks up and whenever he's expecting to see this fierce and valiant warrior king, between the throne and four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb, a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns, with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. A lamb, when he was expecting to see this mighty warrior, he sees a lamb. So who is worthy? Obviously the lamb of God is worthy. We're gonna talk about why here in just a moment. There's, uh, in verse six, this is where I'll spend probably the bulk of our time, and I'll get us out of here on time today, I promise, but there's several things in, in chapter six that I'm gonna highlight and underline for you, but the first one I want you to see uh, is this. It says that the lamb was between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, okay? So uh, between the throne, obviously God sitting on the throne, these four living creatures uh, these were introduced in chapter four. It's basically these, and they're, they're, they're funny looking when you try to, because it's like the head of a man, and it's like, you know, the body of an ox, and it's just like a bunch of things. It, it can get a little confusing, and I get that. All you need to know about this is these four creatures just represent all of creation. That's all you need to know. The lamb is sitting between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, so why is the Lamb of God worthy? Why does that make him worthy? Because you gotta look at the position of him. The fact that he's choosing to sit between the throne and all of creation, he's our intermediary. He connects all of creation. Remember, a creation spiraling out of control, a creation that God was very justified in turning his back on. He could have thrown it down and he could have started all over with a better creation that didn't have a tendency towards sin but he chose not to, he chose not to. And Jesus bridges that gap between a fallen creation and the perfect throne of God. But not only is he choosing to sit between the throne and all creation, he's also seated among the elders. The elders representing the church, Jesus, that lamb is choosing to dwell with us. Like right now, he's with us and among us. And I don't know why, why does he want me so bad? Like, why does he want us so bad? The only thing that's desirable about us is the fact that he said we're desirable. Because he wants to dwell with us, we have a connection to the throne room. I mean, this is way better than any connection that you have to any celebrity or political leader. This is a connection that goes for all of eternity. And if you glaze past this, I'm begging you, slow down. This is everything. Why would he wanna dwell among us? He could be seated anywhere, but he's among the elders. He's among us. He wants us to be on the throne room with him. Look at this lamb. That's why he's worthy, the position of the lamb. But in verse six, it's not only his position. Look at it this way. He's, he's seated there. He sees the lamb standing as though it had been slain with Seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into the earth. 
Now again, pausing here, this is why for some of you are like, this is why I don't read Revelation, okay? Because what in the world, so now you're telling me Jesus has seven horns and you're telling me he's got seven eyes and, and what in the world are seven spirits? I thought there was one spirit. What is going on? I, I get that, okay? That's why you, when you read Revelation, you really do, you need to have a good Bible commentary with you, maybe two or three, just to be able to get the full picture of what's going on because this is imagery and it means something. But again, I told you already, the number seven means perfect, right? It means perfection. It means completion. So horns represent power and authority. Any, any ram, think ram's horns, they're used for power, okay? And eyes always represent wisdom and knowledge and intellect. And the seven spirits of God, all this is, this is the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit that was actually referenced in Isaiah chapter 11 when I read that to you. Basically, this represents the perfect ministry of the Spirit. So what is this saying about the Lamb of God? What is it about this that makes him worthy? It's not only his position, the power of the Lamb, that this Lamb is all powerful and he's all knowing and he's in perfect unity with the Holy Spirit. He's been given every gift. The Spirit of God rests upon him. He has all power and all authority. But not only that in verse six, between the throne, the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb and he's standing as though it had been slain with those seven horns and seven eyes. The lamb is standing, standing. Why, why is that significant, the fact that he's standing? Well, well, think about it. This lamb, as though it had been slain, which we'll talk about that in a second, this lamb is standing up after being slain. That means he's alive, like he's, he's living. Think about this, what animal is more vulnerable than a lamb? Like this is the most, the cutest little innocent animal you could think of. There's no defense mechanism for a baby lamb whatsoever. And he has all humility. A lamb represents humility and approachability. There's nothing intimidating about a lamb. Yet even death itself could not take down this lamb. So what does that say about God? Even God in his most vulnerable form, in his most humble form as a lamb, even then death still could not knock him down. He still laid the, the final death blow to death is because even when he was a lamb, when he became killable, he still didn't stay dead. He's standing in heaven. He's not wounded. He's not limping around. He's standing because he defeated death. Why is the Lamb of God worthy? Because of his posture, he's standing up. And when the enemy tried to take him down, all he did was put a death blow to death itself, and we get to have that same life. We get to stand in heaven one day because he's standing right now. Now, although he's standing, I want you to see this. Yes, he's standing, but check this out. The Lamb's there, but it's standing as though it had been slain. And this is where I'll have uh, Joseph or, or somebody come out here and, and play the keys as I try to land this. You know, I don't, I said this last time I preached, I don't know why I talk about hunting so much because I just don't do it, like ever. I don't know, Brett, can you teach me? I don't know, like I don't know what to do, but uh, so I haven't really, truthfully, other than like my pets that my mom accidentally ran over when I was a kid, which is, was kind of traumatizing. Other than that, I've not seen too many like dead animals in my life. So I, I have no idea what a slain lamb looks like, but I do know the way it was described of how they were supposed to sacrifice lambs in the Old Testament. And ladies and gentlemen, the picture that John is seeing right here, this is not, it's not a pretty picture. This is, not, uh, this is not a G rated image that comes to mind. When he sees this lamb, never mind the seven horns and the seven eyes, he's seeing this lamb actively bleeding, like actively bleeding. So why in the world, why in the world does that make the Lamb of God worthy that it was slain? And this is what other religions would say. Come on, if you're God, and this is what they said back then, if your God was so powerful, then he wouldn't have been able to be slain. But ladies and gentlemen, if you don't hear anything else that I say today, I hope you just know that you have got to be thankful to God that he is still slain right now, that the image is not him in heaven right now as a lion, that the way that John saw him was not as a lion, but that he's up there as an actively slain and bleeding lamb. Why? 
because it means his blood is still flowing right now, that his blood is still being poured out as a covering for the sins of all humanity. What it means is that it's not too late for you. What it means is that it's not too late for your prodigal son and your daughter that doesn't believe and is deconstructed in her faith. It's not too late for them. Thank God he's up there as a lamb that's still showing the wounds and is actively bleeding, is actively covering, is actively offering his blood as a sacrifice in the throne room of heaven standing next to the throne of God before all of creation, and he's bleeding everywhere, covering anyone that would say, why, why should we let you in heaven? Because that lamb died for me. Let me be covered by that blood of that lamb. He's actively bleeding for us right now. Why is he worthy? Because of the pain of the lamb. Yes, yeah, posture, his power, his position, but it's his pain. It's his pain that we've gotta be thankful for. He's bleeding for you right now. It's fresh, it hasn't dried up, it's not scarred, it's not stale, it's actively flowing. It's the difference between a lake and a river. That's why all the, the fungus and all that nasty stuff grows in a lake. It doesn't grow in a river like that because the water's still running. It's fresh, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus is just as risen on a Wednesday night during spring break as he was on Sunday morning when 3,423 people were on this building. He's still risen right now and he's still covering us with his blood right now. This is not gruesome, it's beautiful. This is grace, this is my hope, this is my everything. I don't want us to stay stale in our worship. I want us to have our heart, and more importantly, God wants our heart to awaken. Uh, let, it, let it break you when you're embarrassed of your faith. Let it break you when you don't feel like worship. Let it break you when you come in salty and you don't wanna listen to the pastor. Let it break you, because he's broken for you right now, bleeding for your family, bleeding for your sins. Why is he worthy? Because the blood of the lamb. I'm gonna read to you the rest of this chapter and I'm gonna go over one more thing and then I'll uh, have us sing a song and we'll pray if anyone wants prayer and we'll dismiss. We'll keep reading this chapter here and there's gonna be a couple of verses here. Just bear with me because this is the moment here. He sees this lamb bleeding all over the throne room and he went and took the scroll. This lamb just walks up to the throne and he takes it right out of the right hand of God. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. They fell down before him, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And again, I wish I had time to go into that. And they sang a new song, a new song, because something new was happening in heaven. This was new, this was a new moment saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and every language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God. Meaning they don't need anyone but Jesus. You can stand before Jesus. You don't need a priest. You become one, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. Couldn't even put it into words. Didn't even know how to count the number that he saw. Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. I want you to notice something here. This is so, so important. It's the last reason that I'll tell you today. It's not the comprehensive list, but the last one I spotted in Revelation 5. It's every creature worshiping him but it's, they're worshiping the one sitting on the throne and the lamb. The lamb is getting the same amount of worship, the same amount of reverence and awe and wonder as the one seated on the throne. Why is that important? 
because there are so many denominations and religions and worldviews that are going to do everything they can to make you question the deity of Christ. They're gonna tell you things like this. Jesus never claimed to be God. Jesus never made that claim about himself. And can I tell you, nonsense, hogwash, the whole, all of creation, every creature is worshiping the one on the throne and the lamb. So why is the lamb worthy? Because the praise he's receiving, his posture, his power, his pain, but his praise. We know that Jesus is God. He is God Almighty, he is. The Trinity is not something invented 300 years after the resurrection because people were bored and wanted to come up with a new concept. The Trinity is the best way to describe the reality of God. You have to recognize the deity of Christ in order for it to transform your worship. I like the way Charles Spurgeon said it. Uh, he says it way better than I do. Depend upon it, my hearer. You never will go to heaven unless you are prepared to worship Jesus Christ as God. They are all doing it there. You will have to come to it. And if you entertain the notion that he is a mere man or that he is anything less than God, I am afraid you will have to begin at the beginning and learn what true religion means. You have a poor foundation to rest upon. I could not trust my soul with a mere man. I must see God himself putting his hand to so gigantic a work. How, how could we be saved by a mere man? I don't know about you, but I'm vaguely aware of just how depraved I really am. I, I, there's no man, there's no created being that could have redeemed me. There's no created being. It would have taken a work of God himself to do it. And all of heaven recognized it. The moment they spotted that slain lamb, they knew, we gotta worship him. And he received their worship. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen? He will be receiving our worship for all of eternity. And all we've gotta do is just put our hope in the lamb. So I'll close by answering the question asked by the angel and posed by the song we sang a moment ago. Who is worthy? The lamb of God. The lamb of God who was slain. Worthy is the lamb. Worthy is the lamb, he's holy. All across this place, can we just stand up? And I wanna sing this song together as a body of believers. I wanna join in with all of creation, with heaven and with earth, and I just wanna sing how worthy the lamb is. Come on, let's lift it up one chorus together.